sheep and he'll leave your goat. But look out, your daughter's heading for that boat. Now dance the boatman, dance, dance the boatman, dance. Dance all night till the broad daylight and go home with the gals in the morning. back to a time of lusty travel when the traveler was part of the landscape. We didn't just sit on a newfangled steamboat and watch the scenery go by. We were part of the scenery. We're talking about early 1800s before technology came along and ruined a good adventure. We're talking about, well, this is the era that Mark Twain described in Life on the Mississippi, the river's earliest commerce was in barges, keelboats, broad horns. They floated and sailed from the upper rivers to New Orleans, changed cargoes there, and were tediously warped and pulled back by hand. A voyage down and back sometimes occupied nine months. In time, this commerce increased until it gave employment to hordes of rough and hardy men. Case in point. Rude, uneducated, brave, suffering terrific hardships with sailor-like stoicism, heavy drinkers, coarse frolickers in moral styes like Natchez under the hill, heavy fighters, reckless fellows, everyone elephantinely jolly, foul-witted, profane, prodigal of their money and bankrupt at the end of the trip, fond of barbaric finery, prodigious braggarts, yet in the main, honest, trustworthy, faithful to promises and duty, and often picturesquely magnanimous. That's right. January, Thursday, 1805. Last night was excessively cold. The mercury this morning stood at 40 degrees below zero, which is 72 degrees below the freezing point. We had one man out last night who returned 8 o'clock this morning. The Indians of the lower village turned out to hunt for a man and a boy who had not returned from the hunt of yesterday. They borrowed a sleigh to bring them in, expecting to find them frozen to death. About 10 o'clock, the boy, about 13 years of age, came to the fort with his feet frozen. He had laid out last night without fire, with only a buffalo robe to cover him. He wore a pair of antelope leggings, which is very thin, and moccasins. We put his feet in cold water, and, and they are coming too. Soon after the arrival of the boy, a man came in who had also stayed out without fire and very thinly clothed. This man was not the least injured. The customs and the habits of the people have inured them to bear more cold than I thought it was possible for man to endure. My meat. And he jumped up in the air three times and cracked his heels together every time. He flung off a buckskin coat that was all hung with fringes and says, you lay there till the chawing up's done. And he flung his hat down, which was all over ribbons, and says, you lay there till his sufferings is over. And then he jumped up in the air and cracked his heels together again and shouted out, Woo! I'm the old original iron jaw, brass mounted, copper belly corpse maker from the wilds of Arkansas. Look at me. I'm the man they call sudden death and general desolation, sired by a hurricane, damned by an earthquake, half brother to the cholera, nearly related to the smallpox on the other side. Look at me! I take 19 alligators and a barrel of whiskey for breakfast when I'm in robust health, and a bushel of rattlesnakes and a dead body when I'm ailing. I split the everlasting rocks with my glance, and I squinch the thunder when I speak. Woohoo! Stand back and give me room according to my strength. Blood's my natural drink, and the wails of the dying is music to my ear. 
Cast your eyes on me, gentlemen, and lay low and hold your breath, for I'm about to turn myself loose. Now, all the time he was getting this off, he was shaking his head and looking fierce and kind of swelling around in a little circle, tucking up his wristband now and then, straightening up and beating his breast with his fist, saying, look at me, gentlemen. When he got through, he jumped up and cracked his heels together three times and let off a roar and woo-hoo! I'm the bloodiest son of a wildcat that lives! Now then the man that had started the row tilted his old slouch hat down over his right eye. Then he began, began stooping forward with his back sagged and the south end sticking out far and his fists are shoving out and a drawing in in front of him. And so he went around in a little circle about three times, swelling himself up and breathing hard. Then he straightened and jumped up and cracked his heels together three times before he lit again. That made them cheer. And he began to shout like this. <laughs> Bow your neck and spread, for the kingdom of sorrow is a-coming. Hold me down to the earth, for I feel my powers a-working. Woo-hoo! I'm a child of sin. Don't let me get a start. Smoked glass here for all. Don't attempt to look at me with a naked eye, gentlemen. When I'm playful, I use the meridians of longitude and parallels of latitude for a seine and drag the Atlantic Ocean for whales. I scratch my head with the lightning and purr myself to sleep with the thunder. When I'm cold, I bile the Gulf of Mexico and bathe in it. When I'm hot, I fan myself with the equinoctial storm. When I'm thirsty, I reach up and suck a cloud dry like a sponge. When I range the earth hungry, famine follows in my tracks. <laughs> Bow your neck and spread. I put my hand on the sun's face and make it night in the earth. I bite a piece out of the moon and hurry the seasons. I shake myself and crumble the mountains. Contemplate me through leather. Don't use the naked eye. The massacre of isolated communities is the pastime of my idle moments. The destruction of nationalities, the serious business of my life, the boundless vastness of the great American desert is my enclosed property. And I bury the dead on my own premises. Then he jumped up and cracked his heels together three times before he lit. They cheered him again. And as he come down, he shouted out, Woo! Bow your neck and spread, or the pet child of calamities are coming. Then the other one went to swelling around and blowing again. The first one, the one they called Bob. Yep. I died then. I felt my soul or something coming right out of my body, like you'd pull a silk handkerchief out of your pocket by one corner. It flew around and then came back in, and I wasn't dead anymore. Nick was, to use a term that was common when I was growing up, shell-shocked. In Hemingway's day, this condition was known as neurasthesia. Today, we usually call it post-traumatic stress syndrome. Hemingway gave it to Nick, and Hemingway, by all accounts, had it too, although probably not as bad as he gave it to Nick. The very piece in which Hemingway denies writing autobiographically in On Writing shows that Nick really could be a pure alter ego of Hemingway. In it, the ostensible Nick cites examples from two stories where he emphasizes that central events depicted never happened to him. But Nick never wrote any stories. Nick is a fictional character. It was Hemingway who wrote the reference stories Indian Camp and My Old Man. It was Hemingway who was influenced by the art of Paul Cezanne but yet he has Nick saying it. Now, to be fair, On Writing was one of the stories that was not published by Hemingway in his lifetime. He probably would not have wanted such direct parallels to be drawn. And maybe it was considered that he would have Nick as the so-called author of his own stories in the volume they're published as an artistic device that was not used. But nonetheless, when you consider all the factual resemblances between Nick uh, I think there's a strong identification between the character and the writer. I think it's fair to say Nick Adams was a 
kind of every man or vehicle from the author to explore things from a point of view close to the author's to a literal alter ego or substitute for the writer himself. If you enjoyed this video, please like the video and subscribe to the Stickney Force View Public Library's YouTube channel. Also, like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The Stickney Forest View Public Library District, where great things happen.